desculpa pelo atraso. Ah, é, eu gostaria de... Bom, como hoje nós temos um convidado internacional, nós vamos utilizar o idioma em inglês como o idioma de comunicação. So, uh, I would like to thank you, Professor François, uh, pour votre présence ici. Donc, uh, c'est extrêmement important pour nous de, de vous avoir ici avec du Unifest pour, pour faire la discussion de, de, de un sujet qui est très important, c'est très nouveau parce que notre université, c'est une université uh, d'origine plus de, de l'éducation et de la santé. Et, mais on a maintenant des chercheurs très importants comme le professeur Marlette qui, qui nous aide beaucoup maintenant à développer les, 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 les physics area. So thank you so much. On behalf of the, the Graduate Studies and Research Office, I would like to thank you for your acceptance, for being here. I'm sorry for the, the inconvenience of the, the system. And I would like to introduce uh, our, our host today which is Professor, who is Professor uh, Marlette. So Professor Marlette, she's an associated professor at the Department of Physics at UGFESP, uh, Campus Diadema. And she has experiences in two postdoctoral degrees in nuclear astrophysics. The first at CNSSM Laboratory in Orsay, France. And the second at the Physics Institute of USP in Brazil master and doctorate at the Physics Institute of USP. And she has a lot of uh, research collaboration, near research group, and in two collaborations with the RIBRAS collaboration and LIA collaboration in France with participation in experiments performed at GNU. And uh, GNU is the, the, the institute of the professor Francois which is the Grand Accelerator National Dion Lourd. Uh, and also Professor Marlette, she has a lot of uh, line of interest and basically is in basic problems in nuclear physics and reaction and astrophysical interest. So Professor Marlette, thank you so much. Thank you very much for organizing this webinar. And I will let Professor Marlette to introduce Professor Francois and to let the audience to know how you can interact with our invitee. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Professor Camilo. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, but the inconvenience of the, the beginning. Uh, we appreciate everyone's presence. Uh, initially, uh, I would like to say a few thanks uh, I thank his, uh, his research, Francois, for accepting my invitation to a seminar at International Webinar at uh, UNIFESP of the Nuclear and Hadron Physics Series. I thank you also, Professor, um, Professor uh, Kan Chan, who is my partner in organizing this event. Uh, we are grateful for the technical informatic support of the staff of UNIFESP, in particular, Michelle, Sarah Commerce, and the uh, staff of communication for the preparation of the arts of this, this event. Um, before the seminar begins, some instruction for the participants. I would like to ask you, Please to keep the cameras closed and ask a question at the end of the presentation, please. Um, if we if, if see uh, 75 uh, people in the room, the transmission will be by streaming and the question you have to be writing in the chat. Um, other size, you can open the microphone to ask the question in order of the presentation in the chat, in the description of the chat, okay? Um, well, uh, I'm very happy to introduce uh, the research of Francois de Oliveira Santos. That is, I had the pleasure of the meeting uh, in uh, 2000 uh, in 2001 during the shift in the lab of the Luvanov. Um, Francois is uh, the research director 
uh, for the one of the largest and the best known accelerators in, in France, the new accelerator theme of the, our uh, seminar today. Uh, Francois has the several important pub publications in the field of the nuclear physics and uh, he is the member of the LIA, uh, the uh, International Laboratory Association. Uh, uh, is this uh, lab uh, between Brazil and France created uh, uh, 2018, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Uh, thank you, Francois. Francois, all right. Um, if you're ready, we can start, please. Okay, did you uh, ask when I uh, would like uh, uh, to change the slide, okay? Okay, thank you very much. So, um, uh, bom dia, uh, muito obrigado pela introdução e pela, pelo seu convite. Infelizmente, meu português é, é o Wings, so eu vou falar inglês. Um, so, good morning. So, um, I am from Gagny in France, and I would like to talk about my uh, laboratory, Gagny. Um, uh, this is kind of advertisement of the laboratory. I, I, I won't talk much about science, but uh, but uh, but uh, also about science, not only about uh, invitation to come to Ghana and to come to France. Um, I'm doing that because I have been asked to, to talk about uh, Ghana, but also because we are um, making a great effort to welcome people here at Ghana. So we, we are very happy to welcome you if you want to come, if you want to join, if you want to do an experiment, you are very welcome here at Ghana. So can you go next slide, please? So the outline of my presentation is the following. I would talk about some kind of uh, tourism uh, aspects, and then I will talk about um, the, my laboratory, Ganil, the accelerator, present the, what we have, what kind of beams we have, and what kind of physics we do, and then the conclusion. So it will be relatively short. So a few words about tourism, because I, I want to, um, I mean, to, to show you that we have also some touristic and interesting aspects also. Please, next. So if you want to go to Paris, to Gagny, you have to first to take the plane from Sao Paulo to, to Paris. It is 12 hours play, uh, flight. Next, please. And then you have to take the train. You go from Paris to Caen, the city of Caen. Caen is located in the, in the west side of France, very close to the, to the sea, 10 kilometers from the sea. And you take a fast train, uh, one hour by train, one hour, one hour and a half. Yes, next slide. In, in most of the time, people coming here, they come from, uh, I mean, the tourists come from the, 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 the Second World War uh, um, remains about the D-Day. You, you probably know the D-Day that happened in Normandy and there are many remains, many museums about that and you can visit uh, different remains about this, uh, this uh, special uh, historical day. Next slide. And there are many other aspects. I don't want to go to the details, but of course, there is very nice uh, landscapes. You probably know the Mont Saint Michel uh, um, village and uh, paintings from uh, of this region. It's very famous, also uh, Claude Monet, for example. And there are, of course, also very good cheese that you have to test, like uh, Camembert. You can go to the city of Camembert, for example, to visit. Next slide. So when you arrive at Caen, you will take a bus or a tramway to go to Gagny, to the laboratory, and you will see the castle that is in the center of the city. The castle is very old one, it's 1,000 years old. It comes from William the Conqueror. William the Conqueror, you don't, probably you don't know, but um, he was a Duke of Normandy, and he won a battle against uh, English, uh, the English people. It was in England, in, in Battle of Hastings, and then he became the King of England. And, um, and from that time, a part of Normandy is also, uh, in, let's say, in, in England. So, for example, the, 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 the grand, 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 uh, 30 times, times, 30 times grand, 
daughter of William the Conqueror is uh, El Queen Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth II is the grand, 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 grand daughter of uh, William uh, the Conqueror. And uh, you can also visit, of course, many other uh, interesting touristic aspect, um, places like the, the tomb of uh, William the Conqueror and also different uh, abbey of, uh, of this uh, king. Next slide, please. So about my lab. So the name is from uh, Ganil is for Gan Grand Accelerator National Jondour, so Large Ac National Heavy Ion Accelerator. Next slide. So the, that started, we, we built this, it was in the 80s, the first beam came in 1983, and we are somehow, let's say, uh, uh, related, we have this kind of filiation, par parentage, with uh, the big uh, uh, people of uh, nuclear physics, that is uh, Pierre and Marie Curie and, and Langevin also. As you can see, for example, Pierre and Marie Curie, they got a, a daughter, Irene, who got a, Another daughter, uh, Ellen Jolo Curie, a physicist also. I met, I, she worked at uh, Orsay University. Uh, she's retired now, but uh, she, I, I met her, I worked with her. And she, and she married with uh, Michel Lanzevin, who is a, a, daughter, a grand daughter, uh, um, son of uh, Paul Langevin, the physicist. And uh, Michel Lanzevin was at the beginning uh, at Gagnil. He, was, uh, it, he worked at Gagnil. So, as you see, there is also some, some tradition of nuclear physics uh, from the very beginning of Ganyl. Next slide, please. Today, we are about 45 physicists that includes 30 permanent positions and uh, 15 PhD students, students in, in general. And uh, we are about 200 staff that include engineers, technicians, and also um, many visitors, in fact, as, you, as I said, we really welcome the physicists uh, here at Gannett to do their experiments in different kinds of physics. Uh, it's about something like uh, 700 uh, visitors every year. Mm -hmm. About the beams we have, what we can, what you can use, in fact, if you are interested, you can use different beams. Next slide. So this is the lab as it is. There is a, the biggest building correspond to the old machine that is uh, with stable beams mainly. And there is a new machine that is called Spiral 2. This is in the, in the brown uh, building uh, that corresponds uh, to a new machine, as I said, uh, and new possibilities. Next slide. So about um, here, what you have is uh, the different options that you can have at Ganyl. So what you can get is you, get, you can get low energy beams. Um, can you click one more just to see if you have some... Uh, can you ne go next slide if you can have the energies? Mm. No? I don't know. Next slide, yeah. Sorry. Okay, it is no problem. <laughs> so you can get low energy beams from 0 0.3 to 1 MeV per nucleon that correspond to low energy for us. And, uh, and you can get uh, carbon to uranium uh, ions. And this you can use for your physics you are of interest. I mean, if you are interested by low energy beams, you can use this beam. In parallel, so in the same time, you can use a, a medium energy uh, beam that is, uh, in fact, produced, okay, that is in between 3.7 and 13.7 MeV per nucleon. In general, it is used for uh, atomic physics, medical application, or but atomic physics, solid state physics in general. Or, and the third uh, beam you can use is, uh, number three, next slide, yes, is what we call high energy beam, that is between 25, 24 and 9.5 MeV per nucleon and you do general nuclear physics uh, studies. And you, you can have the three states, uh, the, three, um, the three beams, the three uh, experiments in parallel, in parallel, so it's, it's a very efficient way to use a beam. Next slide. If you are interested by radioactive beams, you're, there are some interesting aspects of using radioactive beams. 
we can produce radioactive beams and post accelerate the beams. And that's that this is what we call spiral one. And you can get from helium to krypton beams from 1.2 to 25 in nucleon with this uh, second new accelerator already, post acceleration. So you have the different palettes of different beams, a palette of different beams. Yes, you can go to the next one. Yeah. Yes. I'm going, uh, okay. Here, this is spiral two. This is another kind of uh, accelerator. It's a linear accelerator. You can have proton or deuteron or heavy ion beams uh, up to 33 NUV per nucleon uh, for the proton, 40 or 14.5 NUV per nucleon for, uh, for heavy ions. But it's a new machine. It's not really yet started. started. We are in the commissioning time. We are providing the very first beam for the beams for the physics. And what is very important that we can have very intense beams up to, in principle, five milli, milliampere. That is, uh, I think, the most intense uh, beam in the world in fact, we can get here. Yeah. And for the heavy hand, we will be able to get one milliampere. That is not yet available. Next slide. With this very intense beam, for example, for example, with deuterium beam, you can use it to uh, fragment the beam and to produce neutrons. So you have a kind of uh, broad distribution of neutrons produced by the fragmentation of deuterium uh, ion onto a thick target. And the, you have in this, uh, this um, curve, in this plot, you have the distribution of the neutron in black, the, the top uh, Top, uh, the two black lines, in fact, that correspond to the production rate in neutron per square, centim um, square centim centimeter square per, per second as a function of the energy. And you see that the peak is about, uh, is at a bit about the energy. Just, Marlet, your microphone is open, just to tell you. Mm -hmm. No problem. And uh, what you can do also is to produce also mono energetic beams. Okay. And for that, no, no, I can hear you. I can hear you if you want. Uh, one second, uh, not yet. Uh, and you can also have uh, mono energetic beams of neutrons. So you can produce it with, for example, um, a proton beam, and you, you induce a PN reaction on lithium-7 uh, target. And mm -hmm. then you have a monochromatic uh, uh, beam of neutrons. And then you can do your experiment with the, with the beam of neutrons. Next slide. <coughs> so I'm going now to give few examples of um, physics of studies that we have done and we would like to do uh, with uh, an with accelerator. It's just very limited, uh, a few examples, not really. We have uh, many, many examples. Please, next slide. So, um, when we built uh, GANIL, uh, the idea was to use it uh, to produce um, a collision between heavy ions. So it's something like uh, tin on tin uh, nuclei to make a big collision with a lot of nucle uh, nucleon, not on neutron, and neutron and protons, and to study the collision of the two. And uh, so the main project was something like INDRA. INDRA is a very, uh, um, it's a four pi, um, ensemble of detectors uh, made with uh, uh, ionization chamber, silicon detectors, uh, cesium iod iodine, etc. You combine all those detectors, many, many detectors together to get uh, um, to detect all the particles of the collision, a, a kind of, uh, um, uh, let's say, CERN uh, atlas, for example, uh, detector which detect all the particles coming from the collisions between the two uh, particles. Uh, this was in, this was improved by new new detectors that is called FASIA. It's, uh, now it's a, it's a, it is able to detect not only it's a four pi so it detects all particles. It, it is able to detect not only the mass of the particles but also to identify the z of the particles, as you can see with the plot in the in the lower right uh, the identification point. It's a delta e, e or time of flight. Uh, I don't remember but delta e. e um, um, plot. Next slide. So an example of a study. So you can study many things, of course, with that, with this detector. 
You can study, for example, the equation of state of nuclear matter. You can study the uh, n over z dependence of the nuclear level density, multiparticle correlations, for example. That's also a very interesting uh, subject. Nuclear symmetry energy. Um, I just give uh, the last uh, publication uh, they, they did, uh, they wrote about uh, using this detector that, is, that was published in physical regulators uh, last year. And the idea was to determine through this, uh, through the study of the collision, it was uh, xenon on tin, uh, uh, it was to study what we call the chemical equilibrium constant, that is a kind of uh, parameter that gives you the number of nuclei, for example, helium-6, uh, helium-4, helium-3, as a function of the density of the collision. And uh, that kind of uh, parameter, so chemical e equilibrium constant, that you need it to calculate, for example, uh, astrophysical uh, events like uh, supernovae explosions, for example. And you put the, these parameters, these uh, parameters, into the theoretical descriptions of these uh, big uh, astrophysical events, and that allows you to understand what happened in, the, in, in, in these astrophysical uh, uh, collisions. Next slide, please. I take another completely different uh, example. So the, the first example was too heavy nuclei at high energy. Now I go to extremely low energy. I got the, what it, we call IRSUD, so it's just a little above, uh, below uh, 1 MeV per nucleon. There are a lot of people working in this place. In fact, it's very, very busy uh, line. And uh, in fact, also the Brazilians, they are, they are very good in this, uh, this kind of work. They come, there is uh, several groups coming here doing experiments. And what they do is they irradiate different um, um, chemical uh, compounds, mainly ice uh, compounds, uh, ice mix mixtures, and this is also related to nuclear astrophysics. In, in fact, my main subject, my main interest is uh, nuclear astrophysics, and you will see it in the presentation. I'm talking mainly about uh, nuclear astrophysics. But it is also related, for example, for some... Um, there are also, of course, many other um, interests, not only astrophysics, of course. And here it is for nuclear, it is for astrophysics. And so here, uh, well, yeah, good, good, good idea. No, no, you can go next slide. I, I go a little bit in details of one kind of experiment they, do, they did. Uh, uh, so a friend of mine, Jean Dupas, that you can see here, he went to the Antarctica and they collected uh, meteorites. In fact, not, not big meteorites, but very tiny micro meteorites. Uh, very dust, dust of particles from coming from space, and you you find it because it is very easy. You just melt the water, the ice, and you get water. In the water, you have some dust, and the dust, most of the dust comes from space. And um, in between, uh, and they published a lot. They had a lot of very good, uh, very nice uh, results. Very nice results they obtained, and and some of the dust they are in fact. Um, Pollution. They are pollution from Earth, from wind uh, pollution, for example. And uh, they, they found in the, in the dust, they found very uh, some dust with a lot of carbon. And they found that that's from Earth, it's a pollution. And they call it uh, penguin sheet because it was from from full of carbon, so kind of probably pollution, biological pollution. But finally, they, they, they demonstrated that it comes from space. So it was a big, uh, big uh, highlight of this uh, study because uh, to find very high, uh, very high carbon uh, uh, content uh, on micro micrometeorite, of course, it is linked to, for example, uh, uh, origin of life, uh, questions like that. And uh, so they thought about the origin of this uh, ultra carbonous micrometeorites. From where, which, I mean, on Earth, you understand the origin, can be a biological uh, origin, but from space, what is the origin of this very high, very, very rich, uh, carbon rich uh, meteorites? Next slide. And they found, in fact, an idea that it could be the radiation from uh, what we call um, cosmic rays, that there are a lot of cosmic rays, uh, high energy particles coming from space that irradiate some, some, some ices, 
and uh, making through chemical uh, reaction carbon rich uh, compound mixture and they propose to that could be i mean to irradiate you have to irradiate uh, certain kind of uh, ice to make this carbon rich uh, ice and uh, carbon rich dust and um, they propose that it could be some uh, material coming from the beyond the neptune uh, area so very far from in the solar system and for that they they try to, to, to demonstrate it. So what they did, they, they, they produced some kind of ice uh, that is uh, with, um, with uh, con um, abundance that looks like what is available beyond Neptune. Um, and they irradiated with uh, different uh, ions like uh, cosmic rays at low energy to see if this uh, irradiation produce uh, um, carbon rich uh, elements and this is what they observe this is what they ob obtained so it was very nice uh, um, experiment and very nice results they obtained yes it could be in fact what we have what we have found in inter in um, antarctica is a kind of uh, material coming from uh, beyond uh, neptune uh, in the solar system but beyond neptune next slide please So probably what is most famous in, uh, in Ganil is what we call LIS, the LIS uh, spectrometer, zero degree spectrometer, because it is a place where for the first time they produce radioactive beams. For the first time they study uh, radio radioactive, what we call um, uh, exotic also. We call it exotic beams. And um, we do that by using uh, high energy beams, uh, high energy beams like uh, carbon at uh, uh, 95 mm per nucleon, and you fragment the beam onto a target that you put at the entrance of this spectrometer. You have a lot of products from the fragmentation of the two nuclei, and you select one of the nuclei by different means. So I don't go to the details, but you can use magnetic field, electric field, you can use materials to slow down and select the ions. And in the end, you, you get what you have in the right uh, up side. You have uh, different uh, points that correspond to different nuclei. One by one, you detect the nuclei. This is energy versus time of flight of the particles. And they, they make a kind of cluster, different clusters of points. Each cluster corresponds to one isotope. And you can see in red, for example, the few points that you have here correspond to nickel 48 uh, nuclei that, are, that were produced from the fragmentation of a nickel 58 beam onto a fifth of onto on a nickel 58 target. So you, you send nickel on nickel, you make fragmentation of the two, and you find about one per day of this nickel 48 at the end of the line. This was the discovery of this new uh, isotope. Uh, it was a big, uh, big, uh, big uh, highlight of the of the lab. You, you, for those who work on nuclear physics, they probably know the code that is called LIS++. Uh, LIS++ uh, LIS++ is now used everywhere in the world, and it was of course it comes from of course the LIS uh, spectrometer. It allows you to calculate the production rate of the nuclei you want to produce, you want to study. And one of the fathers, not only, huh, there are several fathers, but one of the fathers of this is Marek Levitovich, who was uh, here in, uh, award, awarded uh, by uh, the president of uh, Poland uh, recently, quite recently. Next slide, please. Here, uh, this is a slide I found on the internet, and you have uh, several uh, important uh, people who discovered uh, new isotopes. And I, we are very proud of this, uh, of this because we, you can find here um, uh, Alika Lepin Zili, you, you know probably from the uh, from, um, University of uh, Sao Paulo, and a group of uh, several uh, Brazilian people here. I don't go to details, including uh, Ruben Selefi Dishantana. And uh, they came, not at least, but it was uh, at uh, another place with another system, but they work on different on the on the search for new for, for discovery of new isotopes and uh, we were very lucky at Gedi because we, we could discover many uh, nuclei and one uh, one of the you can see also on 
top right, you can see also Dominique Guillaume Muller, who was also very, uh, very lucky in this discovery. Uh, that she discovered many uh, nuclei also uh, in the neutron rich side of the nucleus of the nuclear chart. Next slide, please. Um, we, of course, uh, you, you, we have different beams, including radioactive beams, and we have different detectors. And one of the detectors that we mounted quite recently is what is called ACTAR TPC, an active target. What is it? An active target is target, first of all, that is material that you can use for to induce reactions. But in the same time, it is a detector that allows you to detect energy, timing, angles of the particles. It's a kind of a camera that allows you to see one by one the different events, the different collisions of the of the particles. And this was also, it is working, it is mounted right now at Canil. And one, two of the fathers of this uh, kind of uh, detector are uh, Antonio Villari, you probably know, and Wolfgang Mittig also. The two physicists, they, I put the two names here because they were for quite a long time in Sao Paulo. So they are from Sao Paulo. Uh, Mitig was uh, stayed for several, uh, at least one year, I think, uh, I'm quite sure, in Sao Paulo. And it's very, very well-known physicist and now he's uh, working at, uh, at Michigan State University in the United States. And just to give you an example, the very last publication about using this, uh, using this detector is, was uh, submitted to Nature Communication, I think it was accepted. It is a, what, it, what we can say, four-dimension imaging, imaging of the proton radioactivity of nickel-54. What does that mean? It means that we produced nickel-54, we selected it, we implanted the nickel-54 in the detector, and we studied the radioactivity of this nucleus. And it emits protons, and we saw protons in 3D, so in space, but also the lifetime of the nucleus. So it's kind of four dimension because you have the lifetime also, the time when it decays. Next slide, please. Yeah. So I also chose this example. So it's not an experiment that was accept, uh, was pre published, but it's an experiment that is scheduled for June this year. And it shows uh, what we can also do. This is another example with this active target. So the idea is that was proposed uh, by, uh, by uh, several colleagues, including uh, Valdir Guimarães, uh, Marlech, uh, Asensón, and uh, other collaborators. I don't have all the photos, <laughs> but uh, and, um, what, they, what, they, what we want to do, in fact, in this experiment is to uh, use an helium-8 beam and to make collisions with helium gas to produce the carbon, the barium-12 that decays by several channels that includes helium-4 plus helium-8 or helium-6 plus helium-6 and other channels. And this is what we call a clusterization effect, cluster, cluster in, inside the nucleus. So that's a very interesting aspect that we, you are in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, one of the specialists in the world about that. And uh, it has also some interest, uh, it, it, it's interesting aspects in uh, nuclear astrophysics also. Thank you, next slide. Um, I change, I give another example at another room, another experimental area that is called VAMOS. VAMOS is a large spe a magnetic spectrometer. It's very large, very open. Uh, you can see the, the characteristics is 130 uh, millisteradion with a dispersion of 20 milli millimeter per, per uh, percent, an acceptance of about uh, plus minus 15 percent of in momentum. It's very large, very open. It, 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 lo it allows you to do a lot of experiments, in including uh, experiments with radioactive beams, when the quality of the beam is not that good. It's quite, let's say, broad or like not quite. Uh, the, the spot of the beam is very not very well defined. It could, could be a little bit broader that makes more difficult the detection of the particles. Can you go next slide? Yes. 
Here this is a result, uh, one of the last results that was published uh, about using this uh, um, equipment. So it's a little bit, um, I, 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 don't, I don't want to go into the details of that, but just to tell you in, in a short, short time. So we, we induce this reaction that you see here, it's oxygen 14 that is radioactive. We, we sent it onto a target that was composed of hydrogen. And so we induce this uh, um, hydrogen, hydrogen, so it's diffusion of proton. And we observed the oxygen 14 uh, nucleus with the vermos in coincidence with the proton that is diffused, that is scattered, that is scattered. And doing so, we, you can determine, you can ca reconstruct what we call the spectrum uh, excitation function that you see here and on the uh, top uh, left. And this is a cross section or differential cross section as a function of, of the energy. So yeah, there is a plot here and you, you can analyze it. It's quite complicated. I don't go to the details, but you can recognize the first peak correspond to the ground state. The second peak correspond to the first excited state. And there is a there is a, a deep on the right side where it is with the red points and this corresponds to the third excited state. We studied it, um, it and we compare the states we have measured here with what is known in the mirror nucleus. Mirror nucleus is carbon-15 and we can compare the position of the states and the properties of the states. And if you compare it, for example, this is in the right side on, on top, what is called experimental, you compare the, for fluorine 15, and you compare it also for fluorine 16 that we also have, have measured, you compare the position of the states, and you see that, in fact, there is an asymmetry. In fact, we expect that in nuclear physics, the, the force is the same between neutron and proton, and between neutron, neutron, and proton, and proton. Should be the same. But you observe some difference. You observe some difference that you can see, not, not, not that large, but you see a difference. The nuclear force, we can call it, is weaker in between neutron and proton, and proton and proton is weaker when we are in the in, in a nucleus that is proton rich, and it is uh, okay, stronger in the other side when it is neutron rich, the mirror nucleus. And um, we know that we know one effect that can explain that is the fact that is the fact that in one side in the neutron rich side. It is, um, it is, um, um, it is bound. It is bound for the emission of proton. It is bound, but for, for the other side, in the proton-rich side, it is unbound. The proton is emitted. In fact, it is not bound. So that that difference make a, a difference in the nuclear force, and we can calculate that, and we did it, and then you can see that for furin sixteen it is close to one. That means that means the correction is enough to explain the difference between the two. That is just an effect of the, what we call coupling with continuum, coupling with the fact that it is unbound. But for fluorine 15, it is not good. You see that there is still a big difference between fluorine 15 and carbon 15. It looks like the proton force, or the proton-proton force, is very different from the neutron-neutron force. That is not at all in agreement with what we have measured up to now. And one um, explanation of that could be the fact that the two protons, they maybe they combine to make a kind of um, nucleus that is called helium-2. Helium-2 is unbound in reality. In laboratory, it is unbound. But in this nucleus, inside the nucleus, it might be bound, quasi-bound, or a kind of cluster inside the fluorine 15 nucleus. And this is related to what we call, you, you probably know what is called the Hoyle state. The Hoyle state is a very interesting state that exists in carbon 12. It is the state, yes, you see here, it is a state that explains the origin of carbon in the universe. And the combination of helium allows the production of carbon 12 through the reaction between the, th the the three nuclei, the three uh, alpha particles. So this state that is located very close to the alpha emission threshold is in fact a uh, cluster nucleus, like in fluorine-15, like a helium-2 uh, 
cluster state. Here it is an alpha cluster state in carbon 12. So the two cases are looks like the same, and we are now thinking about this uh, deeply. <laughs> Next slide, please. So I go to my conclusion in a few slides, two slides. Uh, so I hope I did it very short. I hope that I made it attractive for you. Um, there are calls for proposals. The next one is uh, this month, the 26th of this month. It's probably too late to, to make a new one in a short time. But there are, there are re regularly uh, calls for proposals. The next one will be at the end of the year, so in a few months. Uh, yeah, the deadline is, uh, is really short now. But uh, you are very welcome to propose experiments if you have good ideas. It's open for everybody. It's a free access. It's uh, not only available for uh, for nuclear physics, as I've shown, but also for many other applications, medical applications, uh, uh, as I said, uh, and even um, technolo te techno technological applications also, uh, industrial applications that exist also, uh, um, solid-state physics, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, nuclear data also that are also very important. For example, with a neutron, uh, there are still some data that are not known and interesting to measure for nuclear uh, for nuclear um, industry. Of course, I propose you to come to France, but you know the situation presently is not very good because of the, the pandemic, and of course it's not uh, the best moment for that. But uh, it will better time will come soon, I hope. And, uh, you will be very welcome to, to join uh, here in Gallimi, to join or to propose uh, experiments. And of course, there is a good environment to, to welcome you with a guest house here and the restaurant. The next slide is just to show you that as Marlette told you, Marlette Assumption, uh, told, Assumption told you, um, there is a collaboration between France and, and uh, Brazil in fact, the coordinator for the France for France is uh, Ubiraja van Kol Kolk uh, from Orsay University, uh, Irene Jolo Curie Lab. Uh, the budget that we have is 50, 15 kilo euro, uh, each year, something like that. It helps you. It it can be. I mean, you can apply. You you if you have an idea, if you want to if you have an experiment, if you want to come, you can apply and you can get uh, financial support to come. It will help you to pay to pay uh, the travel or, to, or the stay in France, uh, at least a part of it. So, if you are interested by um, by this, to, I mean, if you are interested, if you want to come, if you want to join, if you want to propose something, you can uh, apply. Uh, you are you will be very welcome. Just contact me if you want, and uh, then I will uh, tell you what to do. No more to be had. attention. Ok, François, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Ok. Uh, two minutes. Mm. Well, if, if you have questions. Ok. Um, uh, thank you, François, for excellent presentation. Um, uh, to organize, uh, please. Uh, okay. Uh, to organize, I'm com uh, I'm going to call the name. Uh, the person opens the microphone and ask the question. Please, uh, please click a uh, uh, little. I don't know. Have the little hand here or not? No. Okay. Uh, it. Uh, Let's go to the question uh, for uh, Francois. Okay. Um, Thank you, Alexandre, for the comment. Uh, uh, Francois, please. Okay. Oh, so I have, um, I don't know here. Okay. Um, Francois, I have the question for you oh, uh, to to say about the difficulties uh, of the 
situation, um, but I, I have how the accelerator working at the moment uh, affect this, this situation of the pandemic. So we are ready to work alone, in fact. We made uh, it um, possible. Um, that is, uh, in, in principle, we work with a lot of collaborators from the world, from all over the world. But um, of course, the present situation most often does not allow this. But in the same time, in fact, uh, for the European people, it is possible to travel. It is no, I don't say it is, there is no problem. There are problems, but it is possible to travel. So we 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 had uh, several. Uh, Collaboration. We had several experiments with uh, with people from different countries, including uh, uh, UK, Spain, uh, from what I know. Um, for the Brazilian people, I have to say that the situation is really the worst uh, I've seen in my life. Uh, they are, I think they are about to close the border with Brazil, from the last information I got today, because of the very bad situation that. Uh, you and uh, we have also and um, okay let's let's it's of course this would uh, finish one day of course and next next time so. um, uh, in your uh, presentation there are one slide about the production of the neutron beans mm -hmm. Bom, sorry, uh, I cannot to put uh, his mind. What, what's the the energy, the the flux of the 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 neutron being? So, see if you can show the slide. In fact, the energy it's a kind of con there are two options. You can get continuum, continuum up to something like I don't remember precisely. It's up something like forty MeV, I think, um, from uh, yeah. zero to forty. I, 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 sh I sh yes, if, if you can find it, uh, well, and with uh, with an optimum at fourteen MeV, uh, fourteen MeV. Uh, in total. Open. Neutron. Um, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah. And for the intensity, it depends on the position, it depends what you want to do. At the closest position of the source, uh, what you get is uh, uh, I don't have the number in mind, but uh, extremely high. It is uh, uh, the most intense uh, neutron beam you can get uh, at that energy in the world. Um, and um, if you take it at a larger distance, if you in your experiment you need it uh, located at larger distance for time of flight, for example, something like that, measurement if you want to measure time of flight, or if you want to measure determine the energy of the neutrons, you need time of flight, and then you need uh, to put the, the, your system at quite large distance. Then of course the, the flux reduces uh, proportionally to the uh, inversely proportional to the square of the of the distance, of course. Oh. And uh, another option is to uh, to produce the neutrons from a reaction like a lithium seven uh, pn reaction, and then what you get is you can you can you can select the energy you want, in fact, more or less, and you have a mon quasi mono energetic beam. So well, that's okay. The two options. Okay. Um. For the intensity, also I have it uh, in my in my plot. It is it, it should be something like ten to the eight neutron per square centimeter per second. Ten to the okay. eight. Uh, sorry. I have a problem here. Oh, my gosh. Oh, here. <laughs> I lost you. Okay. And, um, bon, uh, 
Um, uh, yes, that we eager. Yeah, Renata's question. Okay, uh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Hello. Uh, so it's working. So I don't know what's going on. Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. It's working. Okay. Thank you very much for the for the nice talk, Francois. Uh, I have a question concerning. Well, I have a question concerning uh, fluor, uh, fluorine fifteen. So you uh, you went. Uh, I lost some some of the details, but do you have the quantum numbers of this excited uh, oil like state? And what are the energy difference between uh, among the other uh, nearby uh, levels, please? Yes, I have it by my head. Uh, just one second. I try to find the slide. Uh, I have it. Um, uh, Marlette, so, could you so, please? Yes, yes I, I try. Oh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, d I don't know precisely. I don't know precisely, uh, but it is something like. Yeah, if you have. Can you see? Even in the slide, it is not written. No, I don't see it, but. Uh... You're okay. not sharing it... the screen, Marlette. Yes, I no? don't see it. Yeah. Uh, no, it's not. Sorry. Uh, mm, but it's open. So Michelle, yeah. pass me. So this um, oil state is located something like, uh, let's say, 200 kV above uh, alpha plus alpha plus alpha. So it's very close to the threshold, 200 keV. And the state of uh, carbon-15, the one with the uh, helium-2 uh, cluster, a kind of helium-4 uh, cluster, is located 130 keV above the threshold. So it, it looks like um, the same somehow, somehow. But I... Click on the icon to share the professor on the left and share the screen. Hum. Tem que estar aberto ah, okay. o. Ok, só abrir o PowerPoint agora. Ele está aberto, mas eu ponho em modo cheio, é isso? Isso. Deu? Deu, agora. Não? Ok. Deu, deu. Uh, where? I'm. Sorry, François. Uh... No problem. So, sorry. Uh... What's the, the problem, technical problem we have? Yeah, yeah. Uh, what's the, the la last, last slides, uh, probably two or three before the end? Yes, just before conclusion, the last one, last slide before conclusion. Oh. Sorry. What's the previous one with the energy levels? Uh, I'm lost here. Here? No? Go ahead. One more. No? No? Here? Oh, but... Uh, uh, but do you have the quantum numbers, Francois? Or did, did they measure uh, angular momentum parities? Like uh, for the two cases, it corresponds to... Um, uh, transfer momentum of zero equals zero. It look, uh, the, for the, for carbon twelve and for uh, fluorine fifteen, it is a kind of helium two with L equals zero. Uh, it's kind of uh, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so yes, okay. I have the quantum numbers if you want. If you if you are interested, yeah. But it's okay. L equals zero in fact. Oh, it's half a minus. I see half a minus state is on the slide, all right? Oh, yes, half minus state. Yes, yes. yes okay. Yes, yes. All right, and thank since, you. Uh, and since uh, the carbon 13, the core of nucleus, is one half minus also, mm -hmm. so it mm -hmm. means uh, the helium 2 is a kind of uh, L equals zero. Yeah, uh, L equals zero. zero. We speak mm -hmm. zero total speed. Uh, All right, thank you. Hmm. Um, some of the question, question. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I, I'd like to I'd like to ask some naive questions. <laughs> Welcome, please. <laughs> okay, I'm I'm not an expert and not at all from the field, but I have some <laughs> naive questions. A couple of them. 
One, I understood, first of all, it, it's very interesting you mentioned that there is a difference in the neutron, neutron, and proton, proton interaction when one goes to neutron rich or proton rich nuclei. So, this is, I just wanted to make sure that I understand this is not something which is happening in normal, let's say, magic number nucleus, but it is something no, especially in case of of when we are going towards the drip line, either proton drip or neutron drip. Exactly. Yes, perfect. Exactly. I and see. of course, when we are going to the drip line, that means coupling with continuum. We are closer and closer to the continuum. In the case of fluorine 15, we are completely in the continuum. I see. So maybe this, again, I'm not an expert, but I think this kind of results will be important in, in studies of neutron stars, maybe? Mm -hmm. This should be uh, everything that is uh, a, a, a lot um, dealing with uh, astrophysics because astrophysics is always coupling with continuum. It's we always building up uh, nuclei from uh, I mean from free nuclei to to build new nuclei. So it's always coupling with continuum. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Astrophysics in general. I see. That that's really interesting. Uh, I. I really enjoyed your talk. And the second Thank knife question, <laughs> the second again is a knife question is, uh, you, you were talking about neutron beam and, uh, but neutrons are unstable. So they are like uh, eight minutes half-life. So how does one, this must be technical. I don't know how experimentalists handle this. I'm also a theorist. So if the neutron is unstable particle, how, does it decay before it reaches a target? How uh, how are okay. Yeah, that's a, that's also a good question. So, uh, in fact, it is produced in flight. That means uh, you have a beam, for example, bury, um, deuterium. So, and you f break the nucleus. So you produce neutron and proton. The proton are stopped with uh, some uh, big collimator that you see on 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 at the bottom of the of, the, of this uh, image. You have a collimator. So it's uh -huh. it's kind of a really material that stops the beam. There is also um, there is also um, uh, a dipole, magnetic dipole that uh, removes the charged particles also. And uh -huh. for the neutron, in fact, it flies, it flies, but uh, it goes quite fast. In fact, uh, so to to reach the other side of the room, you have a photo on, on at the bottom right. You have a photo. It's about. Uh, something yeah. like 20 meters, uh, uh, 30 meters. Uh, it takes really short time. It takes uh, microsecond. It is microsecond to reach the, the, the other side for the for the slowest one, and that means, in fact, it, it has no time to decay because it not. I mean, lifetime is in, in minute. Uh, yes. Here it's about microsecond. Okay. But for the um, you, we have also to take care of the radioactivity of radioactivity of neutrons. So, in the very at the end of the line, there is a, a neutron dump. Uh, you see it on the top left. There is a system that is called neutron beam dump, a system that catches the neutron and somehow somehow keeps the neutron inside this beam dump to avoid pollution from beta decay of neutrons and also radioactivity induced by the neutrons. I see, I see, yeah, that, okay. The kind of questions I would remember from undergraduate. Thank you very much, that's good, good question. Thank you. I... <clears throat> Some question, Concha, in the chat. I, I asked. I asked questions and please. Sorry. Yes. Okay. Uh, some question or, or audience? Can I ask again? Yeah. Renata. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I went. I went to get a ride on on Kanchan's uh, question. Uh, regarding the proton proton and neutron neutron do you guys uh, somehow take off the coulomb part in the proton proton to get to this conclusion i i hope so but um so which kind of model do you use because it's it's, it's not 
there is some ambiguity to exclude the Coulomb uh, interactions. You are perfectly right. It's not that easy at all. <laughs> that uh, um, somehow you have to take a kind of uh, of Koch model to decalculate the Coulomb energy that you have to take into account to to, to determine the what we, what remains that is uh, the nuclear force. And uh, for that we. There is a kind of, uh, not, it's not uncertainty, but uh, uh, th there is a normal uh, option that you take that is, um, they are not clusterized. So you, you can calculate, you, may, you can, for example, take it as a uniform uh, sphere and you can calculate the energy. You have different options you can calculate. So one option, in general, you can separate in two options. One is, uh, let's say, they are very, quite separated. In, uh, in distance, that is in, also in energy, or they are they are clusterized, so you have to take a kind of higher Coulomb energy, and depending on the option, you get different results, of course, and that you, I mean, you can take into account. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Renato. Um, there are, are there more qu questions? I don't see in the chat. I don't see anything in the chat, Martha, just to tell you. Oh, thank you. Concha. Okay, Francois. Um, we thank Francois once again for present us with your presentation and honoring uh, our e event. Uh, maybe uh, do you want to say something? Uh, uh -uh. I would like to thank you, much obliged, for the says. Um, what I once again, I, I really would like to welcome you here in France. I, I hope some of you will be able to come to join one day in, in, and uh, in, to come here and come and to join one of our experiments. I would be very happy. Um, we appreciate the presence uh, of everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Francois. Mais uma vez, Francois, muito obrigada. Muito obrigada. Pela sua parte, é, nos presentear com a sua apresentação. Uh, ok. Uh, thank you for your attention. Bye. Bye.